Beautiful. All right, cool. So yeah, as I said, most of you know me. My name's Liam. I work as a transitions coach with youth projects. Um, today was really just about covering what to put in your resume and how to effectively write one. Um, it can be pretty tricky at the moment if you're actively trying to apply for work and finding yourself continuously getting knocked back and what have you, it can be really frustrating. Um, so hopefully what I'm going to do today is I like, give you a bit of advice <clears throat> on how to um, write a quality resume so that you're like avoiding as many reasons to get knocked back um, as possible. So if I can get rid of that. Hello there, Liam. Hello, how are we doing? So yeah, good man. Sorry I'm late. Sorry about oh, that. That's cool. Um, just a heads up, what we're doing at the moment um, is, is obviously this webinar. We're going to be um, recording this. This is going to be recorded. So this is yeah. a heads up on that one. So we'll just do a... Um, I'll quickly just get everyone to mute their microphones for the moment. And then if, if there's any questions or what have you, um, we can ask those at the end there. Oh, sorry about that. We'll do. No, no dramas at all. Yeah, cool. cool. So without further ado... Let's get started. So today we'll cover what is the purpose of a resume? Like wh what are you hoping to put in it so that um, you can actually stand out as well? So what to include? What shouldn't you include? Um, what are some common mistakes that people make whilst writing resumes and how can you avoid them? Um, also go into a little bit about like what does an employer look for um, in terms of a quality resume or what are the things that they see that just triggers them to just say, no, nope, that's not happening. Um, and, you know, what does a good resume actually look like? You know, it's all well and good for me to say, this is how you write one, this is how it should look, but to actually get an understanding of, of how to write one is, is and, and what it should look like, I think is important too. So essentially, like the purpose of your resume um, is that it's a marketing tool and it, it seems so like a, such a silly thing to say, well, you know, obviously it's, it's a resume is supposed to help you get a job, but if you kind of understand what its purpose is and, and why you're writing, it can help you to understand what to include to be able to effectively market yourself um, to an employer. So uh, your resume basically needs to demonstrate that one, you're employable. Um, it needs to demonstrate that you meet the job and the organization's requirements, um, that your qualifications and education are relevant for the position, as well as your level of experience and skills. Um, but also that you have the right level of professionalism for the job. So trying to convey all of that in one piece of paper can be pretty tricky. So how can you do that effectively? And, and the best way you do that is to tailor your resume to, to each and every job. And it seems like a lot of work. Like some people may have five different resumes um, tailored to specific industries or the requirements of, of different industries. But you're only really changing really minor things it's it's something as simple as um it, highlighting different key skills and experience that's, that's relevant to one particular industry over another um, it might be changing your career objective or your personal statement that you write at the start of your resume and, and so i can explain what that is in a little sec um, to again make it relevant to the industry that you're hoping to get into um, but also what you might do is you, you may link um, what's most relevant first in the top of your resume. So I'm not sure if anyone knows how long generally an employer can look at your resume, but the stats come in at something as ridiculous as six to 12 seconds. That's how long they generally take to make a judgment call of whether they're going to disregard your application or whether it's worth them pursuing. It's a really, really, really short amount of time. So what you want to do is you want to include the most relevant information first so that you entice them to keep reading. And so, if, if, for instance, your work experience is far more relevant on your resume than, say, your education history, I would list your work experience above your education history so that you're giving them more incentive to read because you, you're, in, you're drawing them in with, with, again, the right skills and experience. And so it's, it's something that not a lot of people do. A lot of people will just use the same stock standard resume for every single application. Um, but if you want to stand out and if you want to get recognized on over everyone else or, you know, the majority of people that make these applications, it's really important to tailor your resume. Um, it's the subtle differences that make the most um, impact as well. So, so what should you include in your resume? It's, you know, something you kind of get asked and um, something that can be a bit tricky to, to navigate. And so obviously you need your contact info. Um, 
it doesn't need to be anything too crazy, just your full name, um, your email address, your mobile number, um, and your availability as well. I think it's important to note that when you are, um, you know, when you are listing your availability to really acknowledge and to understand that you're there to be available for them, they're not there to be available for you, if that makes sense. So the more availability that you have, the more enticing it is for an employer to want to put you on. So if you list, I'm only available to work on one day a week, it's probably not going to be too um, enticing for them to give you a call if they have to only find one shift for you one day of the week. Um, maybe wondering why I've got a very disgruntled looking Nicolas Cage there. It's because if, I'll, like I want you to put yourself in the mind of an employer who has found a resume, they've figured that you're really high quality and it would love to get you in for an interview. They call you and your voicemail is this. Hello? Yeah, who's this? Nah, just kidding. And then they hang up. It is so <laughs> frustrating for an employer if you have a dodgy voicemail or just something that isn't professional compared to something as simple as, hey, you called Liam, I can't get to the phone at the moment, leave your name and number, I'll get back to you. It's so much more simple, it sends the right message and it's not gonna shoot yourself in the foot by leaving um, you know, a, a dodgy voicemail or what have you. Um, the same goes for your email address. If your email address is smart, professional, to the point, full name and maybe a few numbers if it's out of um, availability or you know, it's already taken, that's gonna be so much more enticing for them rather than like, sexy girl roxy's at hotmail.com or something like that so things that probably aren't as relevant for you to include on your resume um, would be your residential address it's, it's not something typically that an employer really needs to know about you it's, it's it's a safety thing and if you get employed sure you can tell them your residential address but um, you can kind of use this at your own discretion and so um, for instance if you're applying for a job um, in the town that you live say you live in Glenroy and you're applying for a job at Coles, Glenroy or what have you, um, it may be good to list that you're from Glenroy. So just, just your suburb, um, your suburb and your postcode. Um, local businesses like to hire local people and it also shows that you're pretty close to where your, um, your workplace would be as well. Um, say if you were maybe a little bit further out, um, say from Sunbury or, um, or what have you and you're applying for a job in the city, if they see that you're from Sunbury, they may think that you... Um, are too far out and not reliable, so they may want to hire someone closer. So it's just about being smart and, and trying to think what would an employee be looking for in this case. Um, your date of birth, sometimes your date of birth can get you um, put in the no pile for, for no fault of your own. It may just be that they're looking for someone who, one, is either a little bit younger so that you um, don't take as much wages. Obviously, the older you get, the more they have to pay you. Um, or someone who's maybe a little bit older who, um, they believe is more mature or what have you. It's, it's not the case. You, you may be 16, 17 and be far more mature than anyone who's 24 or what have you, but that can just be something that they consider. Um, your gender, again, this is not something that you need to include, but you, if you have a preferred pronoun or if you have a preferred gender identity that you would like your employer to know about, then you can definitely list that. But again, it's, it's not something that they really need to know. Um, and a health, your health status and a photo of yourself, again, the content of your experience, your skills, your, all that type of thing is what's important. What you look like and your health status is not something that should determine whether they put you on for a position or not. So don't need to include it. So working your way down the resume, um, your career objective. Um, it's a lot of words. So the, the, the big ones are, are just two examples. So really your career objective is just an opening statement or a brief outline of yourself. Um, your skills, your experience, why that's particularly relevant for the job that you're applying for. Um, and you should also state in your career goal that, um, that the job that you're applying for is suited to that. So, um, you know, listing the actual hospitality or retail industry that if you're hoping to get into those industries um, in your career objective, again, is just another layer of tailoring, tailoring um, your resume to whatever you're applying for. So, an example is motivated and enthusiastic individual with over a year of custom service experience, looking to build upon my skills and continue a career within retail or hospitality. So it's one sentence, says a little bit about your experience, why it's relevant and your motive for applying for the job. Um, the other one, which is 
more tailored towards someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of experience, which is um, I'm an enthusiastic, motivated and hardworking individual looking to secure a position where I can utilize my skills and abilities to provide exceptional customer service. Young yet mature, I've developed employability skills and personal attributes that support the transition into full-time employment. And I'm pursuing a position with a customer oriented employer who recognizes commitment, loyalty and hard work. So rather than maybe highlighting your skills, you're highlighting um, your personal attributes and that type of thing that are still just as relevant. So on that, the next thing that you want to include are your key skills and your personal attributes. So the, the difference between the two is, is your skills is something that you can learn. And so that may be, you might be good with power tools, you may have experience on a cash register. And so you've learned a lot of, um, you know, like a, a, a point of sale experience, you know, like on a cash register or something. That can be something you learn. Whereas an attribute is something that's more personal to yourself. It's like a characteristic. It may be that you're enthusiastic. It may be that um, you're eager to learn. You know, you, you've got, uh, a, you're highly motivated. Just, just those things that you find are really employable about yourself. Um, and, and both are just as important. Like one is not more important than the other. Um, but they, they really work well hand in hand. And so again, it's really important to be tailoring those skills and attributes depending on the area that you're applying for. Um, and you can think of transferable skills too. So we had a webinar last week on this um, and how to apply your transferable skills um, into industries that are actually hiring at the moment due to COVID-19. And so your transferable skills are things that you may have picked up um, working at one job that are irrelevant for another one. So like for instance, I worked at KFC um, and that helped me to transition into this role, which believe it or not, it actually did. You know, it's, it's things like I learned how to manage my time there. I, I learned how to work under pressure there, um, how to communicate with different departments and, and how to liaise and, and prioritise with, with different industry partners and that type of thing too through KFC. So think of those transferable skills when you're applying for um, particular roles as well. So for some reason, this tends to be the, the one that people really struggle with is, is thinking of key skills and attributes. There are so many here. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in and I'm not asking you to include all of these or what have you, but have a bit of a think about, or have a bit of a look through these and see if there are some that stick out. Again, I'm gonna be saving this webinar so you're more than welcome to come and review and have a bit of a look at it. Um, but there are a lot of key skills and attributes you can pick from this list. Um, and sort of go through in terms of what you think is most relevant for yourself and, and what would look good um, for the position. Um, so on this, if, you, if, if after all that, you're still really, really, really struggling to know what skills and attributes to include, use the application or the advertised position as like a cheat sheet. So nine times out of 10, this is what your general um, job advertisement will look like. They'll give you a little bit on the company, a little bit about the role and a little bit about what they're after in terms of a successful applicant. So they essentially tell you what they need for someone to be given this job. So you can see there, they need someone who's sociable and outgoing. They need someone who's respectful, someone who's eager to learn new skills, punctual, reliable, uses initiative, passionate, motivated, prioritizing, multitasking. All of these key words would be really, really, really beneficial for you to include on your resume. They're essentially telling you what they want. And so if you feel confident that you tick those boxes, tell them that, list that. If maybe you feel as though that's not suited to you, might be time to have a bit of a think about, okay, well, is this the right position for me? Um, or or should it, would it be worth me finding something else? And so that's a good way to, I guess, know what skills and attributes to include. Um, it's not to say put them on there, even if it doesn't suit you, it, it's just like a nice guide. Um, work experience. So, Probably one of the, the more obvious ones um, is your work experience. Should just include really, really neatly labeled and set out just your job title, the name of the employer that you worked for, the roles and responsibilities that you had whilst you were there, um, and the dates that you were employed for as well. So they want to know how long you were there for. So it doesn't need to be an exact date, but just like a rough month, a rough year to a rough month and a rough year just gives them a good understanding of, of again, how long you were there for. Um, and if you haven't had work experience or if you haven't worked before, you can use other things to demonstrate your experience. It could be 
work experience you've done through school, it may be volunteering work, and if you haven't got any of those, it, it may be a good idea to start thinking of um, doing some volunteer work or what have you, just to get um, something on your, yes, yeah, some experience on your resume, it might be worth getting um, a reference as well, and just a better understanding of, of I guess, roles and the requirements of, of your working life. So. Um, you can also include like any significant contributions that you'd made or um, any awards that you'd won in any positions as well. Um, and something else that's really important to include or, or to note is that sometimes less can be more. So what I mean by that is if you have say seven or eight different jobs within the space of two years, it's probably best not to list them all because what that shows is that um, you, you probably aren't able to stick with a job for a very long period of time. And, and that's the point that they're hiring someone. They want someone who's gonna be able to stick with their company for um, an extended period of time. Generally, recruitment um, isn't something that employers are overly fond of. That's why they outsource and get other people to do it. Um, it's time consuming, it can sometimes be really expensive and it takes away um, from their ability to be able to do the usual things that they do on their day to day basis. Um, and so if you're highlighting that you've only had a job for maximum like a few months or what have you, um, it may be best just to be a bit strategic with what you're actually including and think about the message that you're conveying if they read that as well. Um, something else just to consider as well is if, um, when you're highlighting the key responsibilities and roles that you had at different jobs, you should try to highlight a, a variety of different skills and jobs. So if you picked up the same roles and responsibilities from one job to another or what have you, it may be best not to go into as great a detail as that. Um, it, it's good to try to highlight a bit of variety in what you do as well. Cool. If you're struggling to buy, like list the roles and responsibilities that you had whilst you were at a job, try to find one online um, and like borrow the, the terminology and keywords that they use. So for instance, we've just got um, like a crew member position at Hungry Jack's if you've worked at a fast food establishment before and you're like, God, I don't know, like I've made food, serve customers. Cool, that's fine, but let's like flesh that out a little bit. And so you can see there under duties, it's you're now just going like serving customers to providing a high level of customer service. You're preparing and cooking food. You're adhering to safety procedures and standards, cleaning, handling money, working as a team, all these sorts of things um, you, you probably would have done at your job, but maybe hadn't thought to um, like list like that and so that can just be another tip for you to use as well if you're struggling to figure out like oh what did i do like at this job maybe borrow some terminology from a, a similar position online all right so generally this is like what um your work experience section should look like um labeled really really clearly you're working your way back so from your most recent position first so right at the top working back down in chronological order so job title there, labourer, um, how long you were there for. So January 2019 through to now, um, where you had that position, so who was the employer, and then what did you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that way it sends the message really clearly. Um, they don't have to you know, figure it out too much by going through your resume and um, trying to dissect a lot of filler or what have you. It's there clearly labelled in front of them um, and they're able to see that pretty clearly. Um, your education history. So um, this is another fairly obvious one, um, but, but sometimes can be something that some people can get wrong. You really only need to include what your highest year level of education was. It's, it's, it's not something like you don't really need to include if you, if you change schools a lot or what primary school you attended, they really just want to know what um, your highest year level of education was. Um, but obviously you can include other things too. So Licenses, qualifications, certificates, anything you've done outside of that, it may be a forklift license, your white card, um, your responsible service of alcohol certificate, um, or even just like little short courses. You may have done like a one day training, um, you know, learning a barista course or something. You may have done um, like your first aid or mental health first aid or something similar to that. And so these are all really good things that I would include in the education history. Again, it doesn't have to be labeled that, you could call it like education qualification certificates, um, but any of those type of, um, again, like certificates or what have you would be very, very, very handy to include in your resume. Um, and one of the last things is your references. 
So your references should really only be two people. Um, that's, that's just like a, a general number um, who can positively recommend you as an employee. So uh, well, something that I guess we see a lot is um, people will list just a colleague or something like that as a reference who they may have got along with really well at work. And you know, it makes, smart, it makes sense, sorry. Like they will obviously give you a good reference, um, but, but they wanna really hear from someone that you've reported to directly who may be a manager, an employer, your supervisor or something, rather than, than someone like a mate at work or something like that. If again, like if you haven't worked before, coaches of sporting teams you've played on, definitely a good one to use. Um, teachers, librarians, principals, anyone from TAFE or uni, um, or anyone that you've volunteered for, please, please, please do not include your parents or your family members as a reference. It's not a great look, um, just because you'd be pretty, unlucky to get a poor reference from your family. Um, so it's just something to, if an employer hears that the relationship that you have with your reference is that they're a family member, they're probably not gonna take it too seriously. So on that, that's a, that's a lot of information to cover and a lot to think about. And so um, what I'd like to do is go through, I suppose, what some common mistakes are in resumes um, and then show you like what a decent resume looks like. So. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the biggest thing that employers look at and just go, no, is spelling mistakes. You can go from being uh, a cook or cooking dinners to something else. So please, 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 please double check your resume. Make sure there's no grammatical errors on it. Read it out loud if you have to. Typically, you'll find more spelling mistakes that way um, because I think that the overwhelmingly, the, the biggest reason people are put in the no pile is because of poor grammar and incorrect spelling. If they've got two people who are neck and neck in terms of experience, skills, qualifications, they're really, really, really similar, but one person has no spelling mistakes over the other person who has, they are obviously gonna take the person who has done the, um, the additional effort to review it and make sure it's fine. The other thing too is that a lot of people tend to list their key skills and experience um, kind of as like an essay. So something here, you know, they might say, I've been an assistant court analysis since June 2006. Um, it, you don't want to tell them like that. That almost comes off as a cover letter. Um, what a cover letter is and how to write one, I'll be going over um, in another webinar in a few weeks or so. Um, but again, as I listed before, just having it set out in dot points is far better. Um, other thing as well, crazy colours, fonts, they're just not needed. Like That is just so much to look at all at once. Probably don't need to include that there. Um, same with this too. Just keep it nice, neat, simple. Um, and that's really it. Like It's, it's just a matter of, of proofreading your resume. Um, but I guess something else to be mindful of, um, which I'll go through in a little sec here, is, is how it reads. And so now that we've got that, we can have a bit of a look at um, like what should a resume look like? And so as you can see here, you've got your contact information just up here. Um, a very brief, um, could even be smaller than that. Like you don't have to make it really, really long. It, you could even just stick with that. Like that would be fine too. Um, your career objective or your personal statement. Um, your key skills and attributes, just clearly labeled that way. You don't have to go into detail like this. This was just something, um, that they've included, education history, as well as any potential achievements that you may have had. Um, you know, you, you may have been involved in the senior like SRC, like student representative council at school. Um, you may have been a part of a particular club or team or what have you at school. List that stuff, it's all really good. Um, this one is, is it's completely up to you how you'd like to do this. This has personal attributes listed as its own section. I, Personally, wouldn't do that. This is more or less just for someone if they are really, really, really struggling to fill out their resume because they don't have a particularly long or extensive work history or um, many certificates or qualifications, then this is a nice way to go into a bit more detail about why they could be um, uh, suited to the job that they're applying for. Now, again, I did sort of show what your work history and that sort of thing look, should look like. Um, this just offered a bit more context because it was only a two week placement. And so um, typically uh, that's probably a little bit too wordy, but the example is just there as well. 
um, as any volunteering engagements that you might have. Um, now, your hobbies and interests. I 100% would include your hobbies and interests if you feel it's relevant. At the end of the day, they're, they're going to be hiring a, a person. You know, they're, they're not just hiring a, a sheet of paper. Like you personally are going to be rocking up to work every day, and I can't imagine too many people are going to want to hire someone they don't um, particularly like or are not too pleasant to be around. And so, if for instance you are interested in a particular sport, like this is just a few that I've written here. But say for instance your employer is really into basketball and AFL football and and you know, different music and that sort of thing too, then all of a sudden you've got a bit of common ground there and you can just have a conversation about something other than a really strict, um, you know, this is what your resume is and that sort of thing. You can just have a conversation as a person. So I think that's something that I would include as well. It's just your, your referees as well. Just need to include the full name of the person, <clears throat> excuse me, the full name of the person that they'll be contacting, um, their position, where their position is had. So, you know, they may be, again, like coach here at the Elwood AFL under 18s um, and their personal contact number here. Now, a lot of people tend to say um, references can be provided upon request. It's a bit hit or miss with some employers. You can if you want. It gives some people um, a nice little heads up that they're going to be calling references because obviously they'll call them first. Um, but personally, if you've got the contact information and your reference feels comfortable with it, I'd just list it there. Um, that's an another good point too. Make sure that your references know that they're listed on your resume um, because there's nothing worse than getting called as a reference um, and having no clue. It doesn't send the right message to your employer. Um, just some other things, I suppose, that are important to note is that when you are listing, say your key skills and experience or what have you, be prepared to answer some questions on what's what's been put on your resume. And um, so, so, so for instance, if um, it says here that you've got, if you, if you have good time management skills, um, be prepared to answer, okay, how? How do you have good time management skills? What made you put time management on your resume? So backing that up with real life examples, it could be the example that I used with KFC as well. So like having to um, keep up with a pretty fast paced environment and um, work along a few different departments. Or it may be something that you develop personally, you know, like whilst I was at school with exams or whatnot, um, I was also doing two sports. I was seeing my friends on the weekend. Um, I had a lot on my plate, but I was able to maintain all of them at a high standard because I set myself up to manage my time effectively. And so that's just something that I would 100% be considering because it also helps you to um, answer questions at an interview later on. Um, a lot of people tend to ask, how long should your resume be? Um, it, it's a good question. Like I personally, as a rule of thumb, and, and from what I've heard from a lot of different employers as well, is that one sheet of paper, so it might be two pages, but if you know, print it off, it's, it's one sheet of paper, is a good rule of thumb to have. Um, but if, if you can effectively convey all your work experience, your education history, and your skills on one page, then I wouldn't go over that. I wouldn't waffle on for the sake of feeling like you need to really stretch out your resume. Just leave it. If it looks good, that's fine. But generally, I wouldn't go too far over two pages. Um, if you do, it may just be worth um, revising what's important compared to the job that you're applying for. So again, just tailoring your resume. Um, and also just checking with your coach too, if um, there's anything that you might feel would be relevant to take out or what have you. Um, now, yeah, I, I think that's essentially it from resumes. It's, it seems like a lot of work to do, but once you have a good structure and, and once you've got a resume that you're really happy with, um, tailoring everything and, and making those tiny little adjustments become really easy um, and it literally just becomes habit. So um, that's essentially it. So you guys can unmute yourselves now. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, more than happy to answer them. Hello. Hey. Um, <clears throat> after this, would you be able to help me with my resume? Yes, I can. All right. Um, so for me, I don't have work experience. So <laughs> is it a good idea for me to just like volunteer during what's happening? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if, um, if you feel comfortable to do that and you don't mind going outside and, and you know, if you want to volunteer um, somewhere that's safe and, and actually relevant to what you want to do, 
For sure, I think that's a really good idea. It, it shows the employer that, um, you know, even though you may, may not have worked before, even during a coronavirus lockdown crisis, you actually wanted to better yourself and um, help to develop your key skills and experience. And you went out and found something and were actively engaged in that too. Um, so it's not only good for them to see that you're interested, but I think it'd be really good for yourself um, just so that you can see a little bit about what it might be like to work in a particular industry, whether you enjoy it or not. Um, and also just to like build your confidence with um, moving into a workplace and see the expectations that they may have set up for you as well. Really, really good call. Um, it may be somewhere like Vinnie's. You might just do Vinnie's two days a week, serving customers, sort, like sorting out donated goods. Um, or you may be volunteering. We actually have a, a cafe at Youth Projects where you might be like making coffees or serving customers again. So um, you might volunteer there. Um, Is that cafe still running at the moment? Not at the moment. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't think so. No, I hadn't thought so, yeah. No, not at the moment. So yes, Elias is um, volunteering there and has been receiving some good feedback, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I would love to go back, but, you know, given the circumstance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's obviously the other thing too. It's given the circumstances, we just take it, um, you kind of play it by ear, but yeah. A very, very long answer to your question. Yes, I think that's a good idea. All right, cool. Yeah. Sweet. Anyone else have any questions or anything that they wanted me to clarify, anything they weren't sure of or wanted to just double check with me? I think I'm good on my end. Beautiful. Was there anything mm -hmm. that, that, um, that maybe you guys hadn't thought of before or, or that um, kind of surprised you? I was just mostly like thinking about the, um, what's the word for it? I can't remember how you phrased it, but like, because uh, at the moment, I mean, I, I'm in hospitality, but hospitality is not really a job that's going too frequently. Or more like, you know, bars mm. and whatnot. But yeah. I'm catering the, job, the, the the abilities I have now to new jobs. That's probably the most important thing to take away. Yeah. For me, at least. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I think that's a really good point. Um, if anyone's interested, I'd really highly recommend the webinar um, so, so this is going to go up on YouTube and there's another webinar that was released last week that um, one of our coaches, Simone, ran um, around, again, like the industries that are hiring during COVID. Yeah, um, I wish I had made um, that. Yeah, and how your transferable skills from particular jobs can, can mark, how you can market them to those industries, but also how the, the industries that are hiring at the moment may develop your transferable skills. In your case, if you haven't had... So I'll just use you as an example, Elias, but say you hadn't had much experience in hospitality, but wanted to get into hospitality, given that there's not much work at the moment, what can you do to develop the skills that you would need in a particular industry now without just waiting for everything to sort of pass over? Yeah, right. Is that, is that um, online, that, that seminar? Yep. More than yeah, I wouldn't mind a link to that, actually. I'm curious. That's the one I was hoping to make, but I just got distracted with um, something or other. No, no dramas at all. Um, just on YouTube. So if you type in Youth Projects, you can find the channel there. But again, more than happy to send it through to everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely worth a watch. Yeah, awesome. Beautiful. Um, anyone have any last minute questions or anything they wanted to run past me? No. Beautiful. All right, cool. Easy done. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, your coaches will be in touch in a little bit. See how it went, any feedback or anything that you wanted them to clarify for you, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to do. But maybe in the meantime, um, the biggest thing I'd get you to think about is some of your transferable skills, um, how you can list those on your resume and why it would be particularly relevant for whatever it is that you're hoping to apply for um, over the next few days. Cool. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a good rest of the day. Awesome. Thanks, man. See you thanks. later. See you later.